We give you thanks, O Lord, for the gift of this story, the gift of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who lived, who died, who rose again to life and is now exalted at the right hand of God the Father forever and ever, our King of kings and our Lord of lords. We thank you, Lord, that we remember this story every single week and every time, in fact, that we are gathered, especially around a table, that we get to re-remember, re-encounter the Lord Jesus Christ who died and now lives again. As we take time to meditate on this sacred symbol that you have gifted to your church by which we can remember you, not only as an event that happened long ago, but as a very present reality. Shape our minds, help our hearts to be enlightened to the knowledge of what this sacred symbol is really all about. May this table that we partake of as a church family on Sundays, may it spread over into every table that we partake of during the week for the sake of your kingdom and for the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through him we pray. Amen. All right. Let me have my uh, Apple TV slides, please. All right, so continuing on foundations of the ancient faith, we have talked about a number of topics already. We are nearing the end, in fact. Actually, in fact, happy December, by the way. Is anyone else shocked that it's already December? Like, oh, like 12 months already. Remember, we were just saying bye-bye to 2022 not too long ago. But yes, we are reaching the end of this series in which we are covering some topics that are crucial and fundamental to how we understand ourselves as followers of Jesus. Why are there some things that we believe? Why are there some practices that we insist are essential and important to what it means to be a Christian, right? So we've talked about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've talked about this story that we believe, that we just sang about, the story recorded for us in Scripture, we talked about what it means to be the church. And last week, our brother Irvin talked about baptism and expanded on what it means for this particular symbol, this particular act. How does it define who we are? So, in traditional Christianity, the, these two elements, baptism and what we're talking about today, the Lord's Supper, are spoken of together as two so-called ordinances that the church observes, right? Right? These are physical, tangible practices that we engage in and somehow they define our spiritual reality or they say something about our spiritual reality, who we are, whose we are and what this life is meant to be, how it's meant to be lived, right? So we're talking about the Lord's Supper today, the second of the great ordinances of the church. So how we've been doing this class in the last few weeks has been we've gone through the story of Scripture, tracing from Hebrew Bible to the New Testament to the early church, restoration movement, and today. However, I'm pleased to inform you that we will be able to fast forward one step because we have already talked about the table several times in this church family, usually during our worship services. So um, if anyone here would like to explore a more in-depth treatment of tables as seen in Scripture, meals, table fellowships, suppers, although they're not always described as suppers, they're meals, they're tables, you can reference any of these sermons. Um, I believe that I was the one who preached on most of these, if not all four of these. So, uh, so you, you can go and uh, listen to all of those for, the, uh, for the, what we really talked about in detail. In summary though, for our purposes today, what the table is as presented in Scripture, from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament, Tables are a very powerful and multifaceted symbol, right? It's a, it may seem like a very simple act, but they are very rich symbols. Is something wrong, something wrong with my mic? Oh, okay. Sorry if that was blaring your ears. This sounds much more comfortable. Thank you very much. So, uh, tables are a powerful and multifaceted symbol. They are the place where we experience and celebrate forgiveness, Primarily, it's a place where, because when you're sitting around a table, it means we're talking together, we're laughing, hee hee, ha ha, you know, and it's a place where past wrongs are forgiven. That's why we can sit around at the same table and interact. The table is a place where the people at the table, table mates, can practice generosity and hospitality. 
it is a place where that's our whole value of being table spreading. We say there's enough room at the table, come and partake. There's always more room for someone else to be added. The table is the place where the worst people can be welcomed and treated as equals, right? People who we think may not always belong at this table. We think of the, when Jesus had dinner at Zacchaeus' home, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and this good-for-nothing tax collector sitting at the same table partaking of a meal, resulting in point number one, forgiveness. And tables are characterized by joy, new life, and celebration, right? That's a, this is a, a wedding banquet, a, a party. It's a, it's a place of joy, of rejoicing, right? Because look at, the, look at the life that is happening around here. And we have many table experiences that we can relate to. So with that being said, right, this is the, as we go through the story of scripture and we see all these tables happening, we see a trajectory. We see what they're pointing towards and we see that the highest and most complete expression of the table and all these ideas, all the things that table contains, the best expression is the Lord's Supper, right? So what exactly is it, right? So we, because we partake of the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, we all have an idea of what it is. So let me try and put some words to what the Lord's Supper is. It is three things, at least according to my limited definition. It is a celebration of past, present, and future salvation, right? Uh, past, because we remember an event that happened 2,000 years ago, right? Um, when Jesus was alive and walked this earth, and when he died on the cross and then was resurrected, we are remembering that whole story, that whole event. It is present because... It's an activity we're partaking of today. We believe that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is present among His church. And He is the one who is the host of this Lord's Supper, this sacred meal. It is also future because as we partake of this meal, we realize you know, there's going to come a day when our salvation will be made complete. This is a meal in anticipation of the future, right? Revelation 20. 21 and 22, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Well, what we take now is an anticipation of what is to come. It is also, uh, the Lord's Supper is a celebration that is found in Jesus Christ, right? There, there, is, it, there is, He is the priority in this meal, right? He's the focus, He's the main thing. And, whoops, sorry, one more thing. It's a celebration through, uh, found in Jesus Christ and His story through the material elements of bread and wine. It's a very physical, tangible ordinance. It's, a, it's a, something you can touch, something we can taste, something we can smell, right? It is, uh, while we remember, it's not just all in our heads, it's not just all in our hearts. There's something important about these elements of bread and wine. That's why we haven't substituted it for, like, rice or something, or, or, or like Coca-Cola, right? There's something important about it being bread, unleavened bread, and wine, right? So, that being said, here are some things that the Lord's Supper is what it's not, right? So, first of all, it's not, a, it's not meant to be a mournful observance. In the past um, sermons that I've preached, we've explored how we see the suppers that are partaken of in Scripture, even those where it's a sac in the book of Leviticus, where it's a sacrifice offered up for sins, the meal itself is a joyful event because in ex it's an experience of forgiveness. So the table is not meant to be a mournful observance and the early church did not practice it as a mournful observance. It was a feast. It was a, at the risk of sounding a bit improper, it was a party. It was a celebration that Jesus is alive and he's here with us. The Lord's Supper is not meant to be centered on our sinfulness and our efforts at repentance. It's a focus on, look at what Jesus has done for us. Look at what grace He has poured out that covers and washes over our sins. Now, is there a place for remembering and confessing our sins and asking forgiveness? Yes, of course. But that's the prerequisite to the main event. The main event is about joy. It's about forgiveness and redemption. 
sinfulness and repentance, we do not dwell too long on that. It is the means to another end. And lastly, it is not a mere symbol, right? Last Sunday when Brother Irving was talking about baptism, right? The waters of baptism is not just, oh, you know, uh, I'm actually being saved by God uh, and the baptism, the going into the water, the part where I touch and get wet, that's just, uh, that, that's just symbolic. That's just an uh, outward sign of what's going on inside. But the water doesn't really matter. No, we don't talk about baptism that way. We believe that in baptism, something really spiritual happens when we go through this physical process. And in the same way, when we partake of physical elements of bread and the fruit of the vine, some, there's something very spiritual going on in these physical elements. Now, what exactly happens in, how, how exactly does that happen? What are the mechanics of it? That is something that Christians have debated over for, well, ever since Christianity began. And we won't get into that debate today. But we recognize that the Lord's Supper is more than a mere symbol. It is a powerful symbol of a greater spiritual reality. So, we talked about the Lord's Supper as it began, right? It, I've mentioned before that the Lord's Supper, it was a feast. It was a, um, some of you may have heard the phrase, the agape uh, love feast, right? It's where the whole church will come together. It's essentially a big potluck, right? So, how do we get from a potluck party, essentially, to something that's more private, a private penance, right? How do you go from potluck party to private penance? Because all the evidence from the first and second centuries, the earliest of the churches, it was a party. So our experience is what you see on the right. It looks so different. Not that it's wrong, but how do we get here? And should we do something about it as a church family? So this is what we're going to spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so on before our discussion. So Beginning in the first century church, it was a weekly feast um, where the community remembers the past work of Christ, acknowledges his present, like presence, right? The fact that he's here now, and it anticipates his future coming, right? So it's a celebration of past, present, and future salvation. So that was how it was observed in the first century church. As it progressed, though, out of the first and second centuries, there became this sense that oh, there's something, you know, there's something very holy about the Lord's Supper, these elements of bread and the fruit of the vine. It's so holy until, uh, better not touch if you're not holy enough, right? Christ, there was this belief that Christ is actually present in the elements of bread and wine. And if the literal saviour of the world is, in, is inside these physical elements, wow, so holy, uh, better not, you know, better not touch if you want to deal with it, if you want to handle it, you must be specially purified and consecrated before you can touch them. So that's where it began to be you know, restricted. There were levels of hierarchy. And so until only the priests and the bishops, those who were ordained for in full-time ministry as it were, only a small select group of people could actually partake of the elements, right? So it starts from a good place, right? It starts from a place where everyone's invited, come, partake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, then it dawns on people, wow, Je Jesus, ah, wow, so holy. You know, better, better you know, be careful before touching it. Scarly, I touched something holy. Then like, um, like, what's the name of the, of the person who touched the Ark of the Covenant and died? I'm blanking. Uzzah, U Uzzah, yes. Uh, touch, touch something holy and then die. All, all the people who tried to look inside the Ark of the Covenant and then died from looking in it. Wow, better not touch Lord's Supper like that. Scarly, the same thing happened to us, right? So that's where it progresses. Then we come to the Reformation. So we're jumping hundreds of years in, the, in these slides, right? Mainly, sorry to call out the Presbyterians, but they're kind of responsible for this. So from this place of where only a small group of people could partake of the Lord's Supper, the Reformation um, leaders realized, no, the Lord's Supper is meant for everyone everyone is welcome to partake of the Lord's Supper. However, the issue of holiness is still there. 
So while everyone can partake of it, you have to be in the correct spiritual state before you can partake of it. Right? So there came to be a focus on the spiritual disciplines of penance and remorse. Right? Yes, you can partake of this, but only if you, are, if you repent of all your sins first. Only if you are purified, only if you are holy first. Right? So with all that emphasis on penance and remorse and thinking about, oh, you know, this is how sinful I am. God, this is how guilty I am. Please forgive me. The tone, of course, shifts at communion to something that's more somber and even dismal. And it, this also began a focus on more individual salvation. It's not so much a potluck party where it's the whole church gathering around the table. It becomes very individual. It's about my sins. It's about my relationship with God. And then this is where we start to think, eh, was, don't we call this practice communion? Why is it so individual? Where's the community in communion, right? So this is about where it really begins to focus on these, um, on penance and the individual aspect. And then we come to the restoration movement. Oh boy, okay, here we go. So there are some, oh, I forgot this last part. This is the philosophy that was inherited then by the restoration movement. This is uh, the restoration movement, the Stone Campbell movement uh, began to take some of these ideas and had the same idea about what we do for communion. And so certain approaches to the Lord's Supper became prominent. Some of these, uh, I've tried to express them in quotes because maybe some of these are thoughts that we think of when we partake of communion. You know, when you see the men to serve starting to walk down the aisle and you see the communion slide and you take out your packet and, oh, okay, time to start thinking about these thoughts, right? Some of these include, Jesus died a painful death and it's all my fault. We talk about, I remember talks about how the crucifixion was such a torturous process and, and, and what the message I got was, and you put Jesus there. You made Jesus suffer all that, right? It's all your fault. Better repent. Scully, he will, you know, Scully, you make his sacrifice worth nothing. So that was, so that's one idea. Another idea, the more I focus on my guilt and sinfulness, maybe the more forgiveness I'll receive. I'm stating these very bluntly, but I feel like we have a climate where we think something to this effect. This idea that the more I confess, the more I bring up, you know, God, I've done this and this and this wrong and actually, you know, I've, I've sinned so much. Maybe my whole nature is just so sinful and it's messed up. Oh, and then if I confess all these things and there's good biblical basis for this, First John 1, 9 uh, or 1, 8, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. So we want to confess, we want to confess. But the more we confess, the more we find that we are quite guilty. And so we feel like, okay, if I confess more, I'll be forgiven more. And in the history of the restoration movement, the Lord's Supper also became what we call a test of fellowship. Those of us who are newer, maybe to faith or younger in faith, this phrase, test of fellowship, may be a bit less familiar. It's a term that basically means can we have fellowship? If, uh, are you doing this correctly? If you're doing it correctly, then we can have fellowship together. Then we can worship in the same space together, right? So a lot of the questions became, are you doing the Lord's Supper correctly? You know, are you repentant enough? Are you somber enough? Do you know how much you have sinned, right? And, and if, if, you're, if you're not doing it exactly the way that I do it, then cannot, sorry. The most extreme examples I've heard of this were when, um, when back in, I guess before there was air conditioning and there was a table that was uh, set in front that had the Lord's Supper on it and there would be a white cloth that covers over it, right? Because when there's no air con and the windows are open and flies and everything will come in and buzz around, so they covered it with a white cloth. Over time, air conditioning was installed and then and then there was no need for the cloth because the, your mosquitoes cannot come in anymore. So there was one day that a, a new preacher saw the white cloth and what, what's the point of that? I would like people to see the elements of the bread and fruit of the vine. So he removed the white cloth and he almost got fired because, because like, 
how dare you touch that about communion? This is how we've always done communion, right? So the Lord's Supper, because it's so important to us, becomes something of a test of fellowship. Are you doing it exactly correctly? And unfortunately, it's led to a lot of disagreements in the restoration movement. But that's not how Alexander Campbell really meant for com- how he, an important figure in our history and our heritage, that's not how he thought communion should be. And I think he is onto something here. He says, Christ did not assemble his disciples to weep and wail and starve with him. No. He commands them to rejoice always and bids them eat and drink abundantly. Unfortunately, Alex Campbell's view didn't make it to many churches of Christ. And so it continued in the more, more uh, remorseful, you know, are you confessing your sins? Are you individually in a right standing with God? It took on that flavor. However, I think he is pointing us back to the true spirit of the Lord's Supper back in the first century, right? So how does this affect and influence how we observe the Lord's Supper today, this, later this morning when we partake of it together. Now, I'm not saying that this transition is necessarily bad. There is a place for private penance at the Lord's Supper. It is a place where we should be aware that I do not deserve the gift of forgiveness. I am not qualified to partake of bread and wine by my own merits. I want to remember Jesus and I want to remember the whole of his story, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the pain he suffered and the glory to which he is elevated. There is a place for private and quiet reflection. But it does seem that the true spirit of the Lord's Supper is more akin to the potluck party. It is meant to be joyous. It is meant to be something we share together, right? It is, and and this is, pointing us back to how the first century church realized it and how they operated. So for us, you may have noticed that our worship leaders, when we come up here to preside over communion, we have been seeking to emphasize more the joy of the resurrection. For example, in the song we sang at the start of today, In Christ Alone, we sang four stanzas. The middle two, that the first one was about Christ in glory, the middle two, or at least the second one, is about Christ who died in the grave, right? Here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body laid, light of the world by darkness slain. And what if it just ended there? There is no, and we do not speak of the then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. That is, then is not a complete song. And if the same spirit is handled, if we take that same spirit and do it in communion, we're not fully telling the story of the gospel. When we partake communion and when we do it together, we tell both sides of the story before and after the cross and grave. And that's what our worship leaders seek to do when we come up here to preside over communion. Now, that's for what happens on stage. How about with the rest of us? This particular arrangement, and most of our churches are not arranged in a particularly helpful way, Back in the first century, of course, they would have had tables. They would be gathered around long tables, maybe, and then where the food is, and maybe little stations elsewhere where people have their food and eat together. I'm I'm not sure how first century meals look like, but it was a communal experience. While we may not be able to practice that um, in this sort of setting, we can't all gather around the table, there are little ways that we can practice the same spirit, right? It, It helps when we, something I remember trying to do was to invite you to look around as you partake communion, to recognize that you don't partake communion alone. In one that I participated in in the past, the person presiding over communion encouraged us to remember who is someone that you're really thankful for as you partake of this. Who's a Christian in your life who you are especially grateful to, to Christ for? And as we partake of communion, And as we remember that person, in a way, we are partaking together. So there are little things that of that nature that we can practice together to practice the spirit of the communion. 
the Lord's Supper. And then, I've said this before as well, that it shouldn't stay here on Sunday. The communion, the Lord's Supper that we partake on Sunday, it's this little piece of bread and this little packet of grape juice. The point is not to just do it here. Okay, I've done it. I've done my job. The point is to let the same spirit flow into every other table during the week. This is where we, we may not call it the Lord's Supper, but our Monday breakfast, lunch and dinner, the meal that we go back to have with our parents and with our families and with our extended families, these things should have the same spirit of the Lord's Supper as if Jesus was present at the meal once again. So we want every meal to be a celebration of our right relationship with God, this idea of salvation, right? Because it's not just, Ooh, I, my sins are forgiven, uh, the blood of Jesus cleansed my sins, okay, great, I can live the rest of my life as per normal. No, the point is every meal is a celebration of, I have a, my relationship with God has been restored. That's wonderful. Now, let me share that with you. Let me share the joy that I have because I am forgiven and because Jesus is my Savior. I also want to encourage us to let every meal be a time to invite the Spirit of the Lord Jesus into the space, right? It's not just the meal of the people in front of you. Or even when you're sitting alone at your table, even if you're sitting alone at home and the rest of your table is empty, may we invite Jesus to be a guest at the table as well. And let every meal be a place of delight and contentment. I'm not sure if I shared the story before about how um, some people in the F&B industry, this I experienced more when I was in the US, they would say, wow, you know, my least favorite crowd is the Sunday afternoon crowd because that's where all the church people start to come. And, and it seems to be that maybe they have used up all their holy energy in church and they go to the restaurant and they pour out, wow, all this like ugly stuff comes out because they've used it all up in church. That's not how it's meant to be. Meals are meant to be a place where we share our delight, where we share our contentment. One example was last Sunday when during our annual general meeting and our lunch was delayed. And we realized that, oh, it was because the, the deliver, uh, delivery rider was involved in an accident. And then what do we do? Do we call the company? Hey, why, why, why you never, you know, why you never contact your company? Why you never make sure the food gets to us on time? Why you make us wait so long? Or, which we eventually did, we called them and really kudos to our sister Lizo, who who was important in facilitating that and asking, hey, is your is your delivery rider okay? Is there anything we can? We're praying for him, you know. Uh, during as we partook of lunch, we wanted to pray for him and just check that he is doing okay, and the company. We're not sure if they were, if it's a Christian person who responded, but they asked, this meal is for a church event, is it? Wow, look at that. When we practice the spirit of generosity, when we know that we have everything already in Jesus Christ, then every meal can be a place where we practice the spirit of contentment, of joy, of rejoicing. So that's an overview of kind of the history of how the Lord's Supper came to be what it is today, and maybe some suggestions about how we can live it more fully. So, we come to our discussion. So, two questions. Based on what you've heard today, and maybe some of your general knowledge, and if you can remember the sermons preached previously, describe the first century church's approach to the Lord's Supper. What was significant about it? And then... Think about your usual Lord's Supper experience. What thoughts grow through, go through your mind and what feelings do you feel? And um, do answer them in this order, right? The first question first and second question second. And then we'll come back at 10.20 uh, we'll come back at 10 20, and then we'll see what um, responses we can hear from everyone. All right, let's uh, be in our groups until 10.20. <laughs>